wherever we worship, whether alone or with others, whether in chapel, at church, at home or elsewhere, whether we're full of joy or overwhelmed by fear and despair. We're thankful that we worship together as a community of Christ. So let us come and let us worship as we sing our first hymn, Love Divine or Love's Excelling. worship in prayer. Holy God, creator of all things and source of all holiness, we praise you for all that you provide for us, materially and spiritually. We give thanks for the gift of your Son Jesus Christ, who showed to us the perfect example of human love. 
We praise you for your Holy Spirit who empowers us to share that love with others. We give thanks for our local Christian communities and the worldwide church to which we belong. May we praise you with one voice. God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, accept our praise and adoration. Amen. So now we come to confess our sins to God. We confess that we've not loved you with heart, soul and mind. That we've failed to love our neighbours as ourselves. Help us to become the loving people that you want us to be. And Lord, help us to offer to you all that we may have done or said or thought in the past week that was not of you. Amen. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And this is his gracious word. Your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. So let us together continue to pray by praying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. <coughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. So let's see if Bear is around today and whether we have any birthdays. Good morning Bear, you want to say good morning to everybody out there do you who's behind the camera? Yeah, so Big Bear would like to say good morning, hello and I hope you're all okay. Yeah, we do don't we? You understand we've got some birthdays. Yes, I think you're right, Bear. I think we do have some birthdays. Mm, let me just check. Mm, we do <coughs> have some birthdays. So this week coming, we've got Amelia. So happy birthday, Amelia. And Stuart. Happy birthday, Stuart. So we hope that both of you have a lovely, lovely birthday. I think we should sing, don't you, Bear? Today, Bear, shall we see who it is? You think you know who it is, do you? Mm? You're right, it is. So this morning uh, we're going to have our first reading from Ruby, and Ruby's going to read from Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 11. Christ died for us when we were still weak. We were living against God, but at the right time, Christ died for us. Very few people will die to save the life of someone else. Although perhaps for a good man someone might possibly die, but, but Christ died for us while we were still sinners. In this way God shows his great love for us. We have been made right with the blood of Christ's death. Saved 
blue Christ we will surely be saved from um, God's anger. I mean that while we were God's enemies, God made us friends through the death of his son. Surely now that we are God's friends, God will save us through his son's life. And not only that, but now we are also very happy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Jesus we are now God's friends again. Thank you, Ruby. Well, that was a lovely reading, wasn't it, Bear? Yes. So, wow. Well, do you know what, Bear? What? It's cold outside. Yeah, I know that. I love chocolate. Yeah, I know that. But just be quiet for a minute, Bear. Okay? Shh. I do apologise. Bear got a little bit overexcited this morning, hasn't he? So, Bear, uh, well, look, I had a present this week, Bear, look. It's a beautiful, beautiful red stone with the words love written on it. Look, isn't that beautiful? It's lovely, isn't it? It's a really lovely, a lovely love stone. Wow, beautiful. So, so I don't know about you, Bear, but when I see a heart, the very first thing I think about when I see a heart is love. And we think about love lots, don't we? Like you said, I love chocolate, don't I? Yeah. You know, we often say things, don't we? Like, I love ice cream. Or, I love to play netball. Or, I love doggy biscuits. Yes. So, lots of things that we say, don't we? All the time we say, I love you, don't we? And so, we also say, maybe some of us, to our parents or to our special friends, um, that I love you. Don't we? Yeah. So we can say as we're leaving the house. Bye. Love you. Yeah, we do that, don't we? That's right. Now, do you know what? There was this group of professionals and they asked a group of children who were aged between four and eight, what does love mean? Okay, so here's some of the answers. So here we go. What does love mean? So a young lady of five years old said, love is when girls put on perfume and a boy puts on shaving things and they go out and they smell each other you like that one you think that one's a little bit funny yeah it is a little bit isn't it and so a little girl called Chrissy she said love is when you go out to eat and give somebody most of your chips without making them give you any of theirs Yes, I know, I'm not very good at that, am I? No. So, Noel says, Love is when you tell a guy that you like his shirt and then he wears it every day. The next one's your favourite. Yeah, I like this one. Love is when mummy gives daddy the best piece of chicken. And love is when your puppy licks your face, even after you left him alone all day. Okay, there. Stop licking my face now. Thank you. I know that you love me. Let me just stop. Stop. Really, stop licking my face. Okay. So if I was to ask you to tell me what love is, what would your answer be? So your answer would be doggy biscuits still. Okay. But do you know what the Bible says? God showed how much he loved us by sending Jesus to die for us, even though we were naughty. I mean, wow, how amazing is that? That's real proper love, isn't it? Yeah, God loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us, even though we didn't deserve it. And do you know what? As well, that list of answers that the children gave to the question, what is love? Yeah. Well, here's one more for you. Okay. God could have said magic words to make the nails fall off the cross. 
But he didn't. Now that's love. I think that really says it all, don't you? Just how much God loves us. So dear Father, we're going to pray. We thank you for loving us, even when we don't deserve it. Help us to love others in the same way. Amen. So we're going to sing a song that talks about a commandment that is to love one another. So let's sing a new commandment. from Matthew 22, verses 34 to 46. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply, and from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. So let us sing together, what a friend we have in Jesus.
BBC's question time. I often find it infuriating when the politicians avoid answering questions by skirting around the issues or answering a question that wasn't asked. And I'm sure I'm not alone in my frustration. Many questions have been on our minds throughout the COVID-19 crisis. Would fewer lives have been lost, lost if lockdown measures were introduced sooner? Were care homes dealt with properly? Could more lives have been saved if? All of these questions are difficult to answer. One slip of the tongue from a politician could lead to political trouble. No wonder they're reluctant to give a straight answer. In no way do I defend politicians, but concede that journalists' questions are often loaded to trip them up. And this is nothing new. In the Gospel reading, Jesus is asked a loaded question. In similarly political charged times, not by a journalist, but by a lawyer. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? This question is dynamite. Jesus has been asked to make a judgment on which of God's commandments, written in the law of Moses, is the greatest. It's like asking a politician which law of the land is the most important. Imagine the field day that the tabloid press would have. I dare say that the lawyer was very pleased with his question, certain that he had Jesus trapped. There was no answer he could give that would not land him in deep trouble. How wrong could he be? Rather than picking out two of the laws, Jesus expertly sums up the whole of God's law. Love God and neighbour. The answer silences the lawyer and the Pharisees, as there's nothing for them to argue with at all. There is something strange about the concept of issuing a command to love. Even when we get past thinking of love as just that warm, gooey attraction to another person, and think about it more as an act of the will, a commitment that is not dependent on how we feel, there is still something that is hard to reconcile about it. There's something almost self-contradictory about a command to love. Because if you're doing something for someone, primarily because you've been commanded to do so, can you also claim that it's essentially an act of love? It's a bit like a parent telling a child to say thank you. You can tell a child to say thank you 
and if things are going well, then they'll say it. But there's not much point in telling a small child to be grateful. A genuine spirit of gratitude will be born in the child at some time later in their development stage. At this stage, all you can do is hope for to train that child in the manners that they're associated with gratitude. And you do that partly as a way of laying the foundation for that child to discover and to grow into real gratitude. And once real gratitude has been born, you don't have to tell them to say thank you anymore. They just do it naturally. To people who experience real gratitude, the expression of it comes completely naturally. And surely love is like that too. And if it is, what's the point of Jesus telling us to love? To love God and to love our neighbour as ourselves. Well, before addressing the guts of my question, I'd better at least be true to the context in which we heard Jesus say these things. In fact, he wasn't giving it as a command here. He was reciting a command from the law of Israel as an answer to the question. And that, con that context is very instructive as we address our question. The question Jesus faced was, which commandment in the law is the greatest? The first thing worth noting is that Jesus gave an answer at all, because some people would have wanted him to say the commandments are all equally as important as each other. But he doesn't. He says that all the rest of the commandments and the rabbis have counted 613 of them, are to be understood as applications of the law of love. If you love God and you love others as yourself, then all the others will be clear to you and you won't have to even think too much about whether you're obeying them, because you will be. So, in fairness to Jesus, we must note that he's not emphasising the idea of love as a commandment, but he's emphasising the nature of commandments as being simply a way of documenting the implications of love. The next thing to see that might help us address the question is a bit more complicated and requires a bit of a grammar lesson. I had to go back through my books for this one. And as you can probably tell from the way that I write, grammar is not my area of expertise. Kay can vouch for you when she proofreads some of the things I write. An ancient Greek grammar, well, I'm even less of an expert on that one. But let's have a go. There's something unusual about the form of the verb love here. And it might be important. It's not the usual imperative form. So let me explain. We can use the same verb in different ways. And while in English they don't always change their spelling for the different ways, in the New Testament Greek they usually do. So if I were to say, John will go to the shop, the word go is in a future form. But if I say, John, go to the shop now, the word go is in the imperative form, which means that instead of describing what's going to happen, I'm giving John an order. In Greek, it would be the ending of the word instead of the order of the words that makes the distinctions clear. Now, in our reading, the word love is actually in the future form, not the imperative form. It reads more like a prediction that we will love than a command that we must love. Now, the ancient Greek experts say that it's a future form with an implied imperative. But the fact remains that it's not the normal imperative and the command nature of the statement is muted by something that has at least a hint of a promise to it. And in fact, if we go and look at what Jesus is quoting from Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 or 5, you'll find that the whole command reads like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul 
and with all your might. The emphasis of command is actually on the Hear, O Israel. The you will love the Lord your God is what we are commanded to hear. And it has that slightly ambiguous blend of promise and applied command. So the meaning is sort of halfway in between. You lot are commanded to love and listen up folks, there's good news. The day is coming when we will all love God and we'll all love one another. Perhaps I'm wrong in saying that it's halfway between. <clears throat> it's more both held together in a kind of creative tension. So there, there ends the grammar lesson. But what are we to make of what comes out of it? Does it make any difference at all to our question about whether it makes sense to give a command to love? And I think the answer is yes. <coughs> So let me explain. It seems to me that this command, this promise, stroke command, recognises that love isn't black or white. You're either doing it or you're not kind of thing. Love is something where there's always room for improvement. But it's also something where you know it's going to take a new heaven and a new earth before we experience the fullness of love that deep inside we're really hungering for. I don't think there's a person on the planet who doesn't e have even a shred of love within them. But I know that there's not a person on the planet who up, who up comes even close to the full measure of love we've seen once. And that's the love that we see in Jesus Christ. And because all of us have at least some measure of love in us, and because all of us aspire to grow in love, then we can respond to a command to love because our actions will not be motivated solely by the command. The command might be the prompt that we needed to go that extra step or two, but the desire to love and to be ever more loving is already a part of us. The command at best will be one of the things that helps keep us pushing on towards that goal. And that's where the promise comes in. The promise that changes the whole feel of that command. The promise tells us that the striving is not in vain. The promise tells us that every little step forward that we make in learning to love God and to love one another now is worthwhile because it's preparing us for a promised future where love will come to fruition. The promise tells us that every time we push ourselves a little further down the path of love, we are putting one more nail in the coffin of the callous indifference and hard-hearted hard greed that have reigned destructively over our world for far too long. Every move of love forces open the gate a little bit wider for the full reign of love to come marching in and gather up all things into the glorious communion of love that's at the heart of God. Sure, sometimes our efforts at being loving will not be much more sophisticated than a small child saying thank you, because he's told to. And at times the way of love will be regarded by everyone around us as the way of losers. So but so they want to forget it and succumb to the greed and the cultured indifference of the winners. And if love was only a command, then perhaps we might as well. But love is a promise. It's a promise that undergirds every step of love we take. It provides the strength for love and it provide, for, provides the meaning for love. When we stand on tiptoes and peer over the horizon of the future, and we catch sight of the all-embracing reign of love coming dancing towards us, then love makes sense. Then even our most faltering efforts at love have a context that fills them with hope 
because every act of love becomes a prophetic protest against cynicism and despair and a courageous proclamation of the good news of the dawning reign of love. No wonder Jesus said love was the greatest commandment of them all. So hear this, people of God. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your might. And you will love your neighbour as yourself. You will. You really will. Give it a go. And let our thanks be to God. So not only do we love God, not only do we try and love others, and we love ourselves. Let us remember to tell each other of that love we have. And in response, let us sing to our Lord, saying, Father, we love you. intercession through Christ who gave himself for the life of the world for forgiveness for the many times that we've denied Jesus let us pray and we begin by using our prayer bookmarks praying for those affected by coronavirus God of healing and of hope in Jesus you meet us in our places of pain and of fear Look with mercy on those who have contracted the virus, on any who are vulnerable, and on all who feel in danger. Through this time of global concern, by your Holy Spirit, bring out the best, not the worst, in us. Make us more aware of our interdependence on each other, and of the strength that comes from being one body in you. Through Christ, our wounded healer. Amen. Loving God, as we mediate on Christ's commandment to love, we pray for the church throughout the world, for justice and peace between and within nations, for political leaders and all in authority, for the communities in which we live, for people who suffer in any way, and for all those on our minds today.
May the presence of your love be felt in every situation. We give thanks for those who have died, especially those who have lived in the love of Christ. May we be united with them in your eternal kingdom. We pray for our churches in the pastorate, for Castle Hill, Doddridge Memorial and the Headlands. We pray for our brothers and sisters from Dustin and Abington Avenue, for our ecumenical colleagues in the town, for the Synod team and for those that lead us from Church House. Lord, we offer these prayers to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour and our friend. Hear us and help us to see you this day, we pray. Amen. So as we come to our final hymn this morning, we sing together, Such Love. So go now with courage in our God. Declare the message of the gospel, which God has entrusted to each of us, and in, all, in wholehearted love for God and for others. Share not only the message, but our very selves. So may God be our haven. May Christ Jesus lead us into love heart, soul and mind. And may the Holy Spirit bless the work of our hands and gladden all our days. Let us go in peace to love and serve our Lord during these strange times. Amen. Give me oil in my land, give me your name, give me oil.
Give me joy in my heart, keep me singing. Give me joy in my heart, I pray. Give me joy in my heart, keep me singing. Keep me singing till the break of day. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King of oh, Kings. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King. Give me love in my heart, keep me singing. Give me love in my heart, I pray. Give me love.